I'm Mike Sheridan, and this is The Dell. Hey guys, welcome back to the Delf. I'm Mike Sheridan. This is my show. I own it now. So that's why there hasn't been content on this channel for a year. So if you're already a subscriber on this channel or listened to the podcast previously, uh, that's why. So essentially I work for a publication called entertainment.ie for a long time uh, on and off. And they're a wonderful company, wonderful publication. I still have a great relationship with the people there. I left last summer to go and make documentary projects and do some other bits and bobs. Um, but given what's gone on in the world, it was very difficult to travel and to be able to shoot those products. So long story short, I did a deal with the guys at entertainment.ie and packed house the company that owns it and bought the show back. So the show is 100% independent this season. Um, it's supported by a company, like an amazing Irish company called Spotlight Oral Care, who I'll talk about a little bit later on during the interview too. Um, and I'm really delighted to have their support this season for the show too, because they've really helped make it happen and just give us the resources to be able to push the show a little bit further. So I can't think of a better guest for a, a launch guest. And I say this to Bill pr probably more than once. So I'm a huge fan of Bill Burr. I don't know many people who aren't, to be honest with you. He's one of the best stand-up comics working, in, working today, anywhere. I've seen him live a bunch of times. I saw him do his last special, Paper Tiger, in Tree Arena. I saw him do another version of it in Prague and both times killed it. He's one of those guys you can always go back and watch his older specials and they're still funny. So Bill has uh, two projects out on the same day. So on June 12th, he has, uh, his, well, his biggest role, I think, in a mainstream movie for sure, um, in The King of Staten Island. He's hilarious in it. Him and Marissa Tomei are fantastic in it. It's a Pete Davidson starring movie directed by Judd Apatow and it's really funny. Um, he also has the latest season for F is for Family on Netflix. So it's a huge, hugely popular series on Netflix. If you haven't watched it already, do go back and start binging it. They're super short episodes. It's animated, so they can just get away with a lot, lot more. So yeah, this is 30 minutes of me talking to Bill Burr. Being authentic, the whole point of this season is I, I want the interviews and the discussions or the conversations, whatever they end up being, to be authentic. We're really lucky this season in terms of the people that we've been able to get to do the show, especially because it's independent. And again, I, I really cannot think of a, a of a better launch guest than Bill Burr. So do enjoy the interview. Uh, if you liked it, subscribe, comment, and let me know what you think. Or if you're listening to this as a podcast, uh, make sure you review and be sound. Thanks, guys, and enjoy the interview. What's going on, Bill? Are you well? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Easiest make... press story I've ever had to do. I get to do it from home. What's going on? Have you done a lot of press like this? Uh, I've done a lot of podcasts. And then this week, you know, with um, um, uh, King of Staten Island and Efforts for Family only being a couple weeks away, I'm starting to do more. I did some of this stuff yesterday. Okay. And are you, you're enjoying that it's from home. You're enjoying you don't have to go into a studio or go through LA traffic and, and all that. Yeah, and I don't have to pollute the air and it can stay in the air it's like beautiful out here now so i'm hoping at the end of this pandemic that everybody is be like hey i don't need to fly everywhere for a meeting i don't need to drive everywhere and sit across the table we've had this star trek technology for a long time and for some reason we've never used it um i don't know about you but i mean i like going to the airport if i'm going on vacation with my family but uh you know to, to just be like on a business trip or something like that. Obviously, as a comedian, I have to go. But I'm just saying, if I was like in the business world, I'd be like, guys, we can do this from our houses. It's, it's all going <laughs> to change now. That's it. It's, it's all gonna Well, you'll change. finally be able to have it all because forever they're always like, can women have it all? Can you have it all? Can this guy have it all? The problem was is you had to go places. If you want to be successful, you had to make sacrifices at home. This way, you could actually be you know corporate rating a company from your hot office in your own house and then go play frisbee with your kid and you can have it all you're uh, you're coping pretty well throughout the whole pandemic right 
you, you've been you've been doing okay. We're doing this at the end of May, so I know what the the yeah. I, I've been a little there. agitated, irritated, a little snippy lately, and I think because um, I just I just sort of go, oh, this this sucks, so then I go like, well, everybody's going to say it sucks, so I'm going to go the opposite way, and I just sort of I don't acknowledge my feelings. I think is what I do. So because people keep asking me, do you miss stand up? And it's like, no, I don't. But now I think I do, which is I'm just not in touch with it. So I'm just kind of being a lunatic. So um, I got to make sure I work out every day, play a little drums, get it out, play t-ball with my daughter, just run around a little bit. Because I'm used to, you know, I've been doing this for 28 years. I'm used to just go, 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 which also wasn't good. But to then just immediately stop and then go the exact opposite extreme. Yeah, it's been a little weird. Could my forehead be any shinier with the <laughs> overhead lighting? Look at look at my look at his head of hair. It's ridiculous. It's grown outwards. And it's tremendous. Own, you should be happy. <laughs> in my own head, I'm like, you know what? I could look like Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire. He has that kind of hair going on. It's more like Donald Trump Jr. You know, it's like <laughs> reality versus, you know what? No, you got good hair. Donald Trump, I think Donald Trump had some issues and then he fixed them. And yeah. then he just kept he kept the swoop. But I think there was for a while that was, he had the uh, the mother of all comb overs. So do you find that having the podcast has helped you, like that structure? So you, you've obviously got your own podcast. You've got a podcast with Bert as well. So Bert was yeah. actually the last interview we did on this show last year before I bought the show. So we actually shot with Bert in Vicker Street. Oh, cool. um, so we, yeah. we, we talked with you a fair bit as well. But is that, giving your, is that giving you a bit of structure? Because you would be doing the two podcasts a week and doing the new podcast as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, podcasting is easy. Stand up is easy. Like tra it's the travel that sucks. Other than that, I don't have a real job. I just the shit you and your friends do in a pub is what I do, and somehow get paid for it. I don't know why. I'm I'm thankful for it, but um, yeah, the only thing that sucks about my job really is uh, is is the travel, the travel, the travel, the travel, and being away from your family. But I mean, the payoff's pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, I, I it's yeah, podcasting is easy. <laughs> You've got a you you mentioned a 28 years at this, Bill. It's a like June 12th is pretty big. I know it's your birthday around around then as well. But June 12th is a is a pretty big day. Um you've got your yeah, F is for family, the new season of a dropping. And you've got, you know, like kind of a co-star and role, really, in a in a Judd Apatow movie. So does this feel like accumulation of those 28 years, or, or you always seem like somebody who kind of went with the flow a little bit? Um, I was definitely a slow burn, 28 year overnight success, basically. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically how it's happening for me, to be honest with you, is kind of how it happens for most people. There's very rare people that, uh, make it super fast and, you know, I mean, it happens and stuff, but I think most of us, we have to work for a while. And then there's other people who just have it. Like I, and I've worked with guys like that both men and women I've, I've worked with comics and it's, it's, it's pretty amazing when you see it. Cause a lot of us I think can, can get to a, a level of performing that you're ready talent wise to handle something, but you got to mentally be ready for it. And there's things that people do to sabotage it and screw it up and hold it at bay. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. But there's, there's a few people that I've seen that were kind of born with the talent and the confidence and just like, I saw that with like Kevin Hart. I saw it with Dane Cook, um, John Mulaney, John Mulaney. I worked with him in Chicago. He was like a feature act. And I was just looking at him like, this guy looks like he's hosting the Oscars. I mean, he just, his poise, his, his joke writing. It was just like, he was so polished and so good I mean, he was, he was in a lot of ways, he was on that night, he was the better comic. I mean, I was there, ah, fucking, fucking, you know, doing whatever the hell I do, but he was up there and it was like, here's my idea, here's the execution, now you laugh. It was just bang, bang. I mean, everything was just going over the fence. And, you know, I did a zillion gigs and worked with a zillion comics and that, working with him, first time I saw John, that really stuck out to me. Do you feel like the game is changing a little bit now because... I mean, especially with the Rogan deal, it's just gone through to Spotify, obviously, which is amazing. Before that, Bill Simmons did something very yes, similar. Yes, and I want to tell all the, all, the, all the young podcasters out there, all right, 
agents are pissed about that deal. <laughs> That they didn't wet their beaks on that thing. So now what they're going to try to do, all you young comics out there and, and young performers, they're going to try to sign you to a deal where, where they're going to help you create your podcast and they're going to own it with you. And they're going to try to make it, make it like when you, back in the day, if you booked a sitcom, right? Or, or, or something, right? And, and then you left your agent. For the life of that sitcom, you had to pay them because they did something. They're going to try to get in that. Their job is to get in the middle of the money flowing to you so it passes through them, they get it, and then they write a check to you that has your money, but their name on the fucking check. And when that happens, there's no way you can steal from them and they can rob you fucking blind. Young people, there's no fucking reason to not own your podcast. Anybody, you just buy a microphone and record. You got a, you're a podcaster. Why would you give something? They'd be like, well, we have connections, we could blah, 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 blah. Fuck all that, believe in your talent. Get your following going. Do the fucking work. Don't take the shortcut. And then uh, you can do it. Every once in a while, an artist slips through their fingers and they miss out on a big fucking deal and it pisses them off. I'll tell you, there's a few deals that I've seen like that. Um, when Jerry Seinfeld's show, when Seinfeld's show went to syndication, I guarantee you all, all the suits were like, how the fuck do we owe us? How the fuck do we owe a stand-up comic $500 million? <laughs> Go back and look at that deal. Don't ever give that deal out again. And that was it. No one, I think Ray Romano almost got it. But I think they were starting to smarten up or something like that. But that, that was it. They're like, fuck that. We get the money. Money goes to us, and then we, we break off a little bit to you. And then we say there's all these expenses, and then you audit them, and then you have to sign a fucking NDA before they open their books. And then you see that they're robbing you blind and then they'll give you like 10% of what the fuck they owed you. And then they'll say, that's how business is done. <laughs> but that's almost like how, you know, new media or independent shows, independent podcasts are, have become so part of the mainstream now because they're get, starting to get ripped off by agents or that's going to yeah, happen. That's, that's what, what they're going to try to do. That's why we created all things comedy because, well, you know, I've been in the business long enough and artists always create a scene. And then the businessman comes in and figures out how to make money for it, which is good. But the thing is, is they then stick themselves up here and you're here. And then you're always, the money's always going to them. You know, it's like, I thought we were in business. I thought we were making money off of them. And it's not, we're making money off of them and off of you. And we own it and go fuck yourself. <laughs> Dude, go look at that. Uh, what Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings made $6 billion. Gross, $6 billion. Three movies. A fucking movie that grows six billion dollars on paper. They are not in profit. They're not in profit, and the, like the director had to sue them to get paid. They shot it in New Zealand, so it wasn't SAG. They paid the actors once, fucked all of them. <laughs> I'm telling you. And then you go on Twitter, like, oh, these fucking celebrities just sitting by their pools. These fucking business cunts got a straw in all of our pools trying to suck all the water out like that guy in fucking There Will Be Blood. But it's a, it's a kind of a further indication of how things are changing now as well because both of these, both of your, the show F is for Family and The King of Staten Island, they're like F is for Family is obviously Netflix, but The King of Staten Island is available on demand. So there's kind of people already been cut out there, right? So that's a less of the margins that they can kind of gray a little bit because, you know, people pay their 20, uh, I don't know about that, because I, I think back in the day, even if you had a movie in the movie theaters, it wasn't as big as being on Netflix. Netflix was worldwide. If you were in like the showcase cinemas and stuff like that. But the thing about it is, is, is the, the movies is, is still a huge, huge thing. I, movie theaters, I, they're never going to go away. I don't think they're ever going to go away. There's just like, it's just, it's a better experience, to be honest with you. It just is. And I've been over to some, you know, some pretty rich people's houses a few times, you know, and I've sat in their home theaters. It's still not as good. The sound is not going to be as good. The screen isn't as good. And then for some reason, they still have the same stupid chairs, which I don't understand. It's like, why don't we just all have a big fucking sofa we're laying on? It's the experience, isn't it? It's the experience of being in a room full of like people and the experience of popcorn and everything else. Yeah, and, and the food tastes better. Replicate that. Yeah. I went over to buddies of mine and he had like, like the fucking candy was all stale. You could tell he had this <laughs> thing made and then he, he outfitted it. And for like three days, it looked like this showcase cinema. And then you get there and I'm sitting there like, this guy's worth like a zillion dollars. And why is this Hershey Kiss going to knock my filling out? <laughs> and I also think just as a comic, it's way better to go to the movies 
and all of that stuff, the interacting, trying to hear the words over the guy munching the popcorn, that's all part of a, 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 a great human experience that is really getting lost with, I think, with a lot of technology. Like I, uh, I broke the screen on my cell phone, right, at the Apple store. How funny is that, right? <laughs> Because they couldn't help me with something else, and I was fucking throwing my shit in my bag. I didn't realize that I had my phone underneath my bag. So I smashed the shit out of it, and I was busy. So I was like, oh, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. And then the fucking pandemic came, and then I couldn't, uh, couldn't get it fixed. So I was riding it out, riding it. Every time I dropped it, there'd be more little spider webs on it to the point there was a chunk taken out of it. And I thought for some reason, I thought some sort of liquid was going to fall out, but there was nothing. There was just plastic behind it. And then uh, Saturday, I was wearing sweatpants. They had like extra shallow pockets. It was like ridiculous. I didn't even know what you could even put in there. And I got in the car, my wife's SUV, and as I was shutting the door, it slid out and got mushed. So I lost all my contacts. My phone still works, but I, I can't see anything on it. So anybody watching this, if you know me, send me a text and let me know who you are. But uh, the point of this is I haven't had a phone for like four or five days. It's been great. Boys I, been great. I, can, I can do texting on my, uh, my laptop and I haven't talked to anybody. It's, it's, it's been good. It's been a good thing. <laughs> hey guys, sorry to interrupt the show. I just wanted to briefly tell you about our sponsor for this season of the Delve, Spotlight Oral Care, which is an Irish company founded by two Irish dentists. Uh, they're a sustainable company. They're an ethical company. So Long story short about me and my teeth, I had my teeth straightened a couple of years ago. It made me hyper aware of oral care in general. Spotlight Oral Care really recognized that and do products specific for people. And um, so I've been using their men's teeth whitening strips for a couple of weeks now. I've found them fantastic. I've also been using, which is the, which is the crown and the jewel for me, uh, the Sonic Toothbrush, which is just a phenomenal product. It's got three different settings and it's got a two minute timer. So you're, you're cleaning your teeth for two minutes. I'm using their uh, sensitive toothpaste and you're cleaning your teeth for two minutes and it just switches off. You're like, okay, I've brushed my teeth for the sufficient amount of time. They've also given us a discount code of DELVE25. So if you use the code DELVE25, you'll get 25% off any Spotlight oral care products on their site. Back to the show. I want to talk about, there's a correlation between F is for Family and uh, the King of Staten Island. I think there is anyway, because I've got a friend who's a professional athlete and I've got another friend who is in the fire services here. And mm -hmm. what those two guys say to me is that when they're not in work or if they're away from work, my friend has since retired from being he's a professional soccer player. He's retired. He misses what we'd call the crack. You wouldn't call it that. We'd call it the crack or the banter. Um, right. And he misses that kind of group, you know, those kind of group interactions yeah. and having the guys there. And they all, obviously you have that in the King of Staten Island. You play uh, a fireman in it. And then there's the writer's room in F is for Family which just sounds like a very similar experience in, in, in so many ways. Is that, is that, was that almost like the closest thing to becoming an athlete to some degree, like having that, <laughs> having those interactions? Writing on a cartoon and pretending to be a fireman. Is that like being a professional athlete? I'm going to say no. Say uh, but I mean, there's definitely, I guess, you know, a bit of a stretch. There is, um, writer's room is different. Writer's room is weird. Writer's Room is fun, but it's, it's, it's so much friggin' work. And um, on the days when it's flowing, it's, it's some of the most fun you'll ever have. But when it's not working, or you got a note from, you know, Netflix or Go Mono we're in business with, and you know it's a good note, and you know you need to address it, and you're trying to shoehorn it back in, and you got to pull, it's like, it's, I don't know what, it's like you're finishing doing the wall and then you realize you've just messed up something with the, the plumbing and you got to reopen the wall and just start all over again. Those are the days where you're just like, this, this sucks. But the firefighting stuff, um, um, I would say hanging out at the firehouse would be if I was a fireman and busting balls and, and washing the trucks and just doing that shit, smoking cigars would be fun as hell. But I will tell you, they, they had us do like very, very little like fire, fireman training, you know, and uh, they had us go into a room and stuff. And then, you know, they had a fire and stuff. And it's just, it's, it's, it's just walking up one flight of stairs with all of that stuff on. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. And then the next time you had to go up two flights of stairs, this was out on uh, one of those islands in New York, not Roosevelt Island. There's this whole structure that they light on fire and then you put it out. And, you know, it's part of the training. I think Dennis Leary 
was a major part of helping that thing get built. And um, I just tell you, like, it's scary. It was scary, even like knowing, like, they had you go into a room and just feel around, you know, and you couldn't see anything and breathing with that mask. And even though it was fake smoke, and at any point they could just pull you out, it was very claustrophobic. And just the heat of the fire and stuff. And uh, these guys told me that, you know, you knew it was time to, you, you, your, your earlobes were your, your sort of your temperature gauge as far as whether they get out of there. And he talked about guys who would come out and their earlobes had melted off. And I was just like, I mean, it's, it's, it's no joke. It's really like a, uh, um, I, I don't know. It's the weirdest thing where it's a lot like a comedy club where you're hanging out, busting balls. And, but then like any day you could literally die in a horrific way, by the way. So, um, like, what was that one recently? I saw this, this footage of this fire where they went in and they didn't realize there was like all this butane in boxes and it blew up. And these guys were running down, back down the ladder truck, running down the ladder that was engulfed in flames. It looked like a Marvel comic movie. And they were just flying down this thing. And, and I'm just like thinking their earlobes are burned off and that suit can only hold the heat out for so long. I, I can't imagine, and, and you can't breathe, the, the flames taking up all the oxygen and stuff. It's like, it's a, um, it's, it's quite a job. I, I don't, yeah, I don't think, <laughs> I, like, I don't have, you have the balls to do stand up. It's like, yeah, no point in my earlobe's gonna get melted off. Well, you know? this, well, well Steve Pasemi, right? Steve Pasemi was a firefighter. He, he was a firefighter for four years or something like that. And I know he went back after 9-11 uh, to volunteer. So he's been there. Like, that's very real for him, too. Did he have any stories? Uh, yeah, we had those, like, three or four people who were actually a uh, couple. At, I think three of them were still active on there. So they were kind of helping us out so we didn't look like a bunch of actors pretending to fight a fire. Um, yeah, I, I got to talk to Steve a little bit about that stuff. I mean, I was asking about Reservoir Dogs and shit like that, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but um <laughs> but there was a guy mario giselle there was a there was like three or four people on there that were that were um actual firefighters and uh it's cool man they have like this it's cool they got like a poise to them that uh you know and they definitely have like that team sort of mentality where they were I am I was this looking stupid now you're doing great you're doing great just make sure you do this blah 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 so in my head I'm going okay so I looked a little stupid but he's giving me the add a voice so I can even just like putting up the ladder there's a way to do it so you don't look like you know you're in the three stooges so um yeah it was a lot of fun and it's that dark sense of humor as well I, like I know that from my friends in the Dublin Fire Brigade here where it's how they deal with it, right? It's how they deal with the crazy shit that they see. They all kind of rib on each other. Yeah, that's why it's so stupid when comedians get in trouble for making jokes about stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of people that either choose not to understand humor or they just don't. Like, it's like people make jokes, you know, walking on a battlefield seeing dead soldiers. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that you think it's funny. It's just you, it's a way of uh, coping. It's a coping mechanism. Like, I don't want to feel that awful feeling, so I'm going to make a joke. So it's actually because you care, because you're feeling feelings, you, but it's just you don't feel like feeling them. I mean, I don't need to tell the Irish that, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so that's what I do like, though. Uh, you guys, you know, I've, I've seen the uh, F is for family translated into a number of languages. I imagine with you guys, they probably just keep, you know, my voice when F is oh, for yeah, family. It's, yeah, it's all, it's all in English. It's all in the same, yeah. But I, I saw... Uh, I've seen it in, um, I saw the Mexican version of it and it sounded, it was hilarious because it sounds like it translates perfectly. Like I feel like, uh, you know, certain Americans, the Irish, Scottish people, Mexican, a lot of Latinos, we have that short fuse, emotional, big heart, but we'll say crazy shit and then afterwards be like, yeah, sorry about that. Um, it seems to play really well in those areas. Like, we watch it in the writer's room. Like, we've watched, like, the Brazilian, the Colombian, um, Russian, and we laugh our asses off. Like, some of it, like, it, you know, if the, if the language is too, like, smooth or, like, eloquent, it adds, like, a, a new kind of, like, 
humor to it, but in our heads we're like, well, we know there has to be a Frank Murphy in, in every one of these countries. So there's a variation um, of a lot of the characters. You um, yeah. I've I've been to I've been to most of the shows you've done here, pro probably all of them, and it was interesting your reaction to the Irish crowd and the Irish crowd, and you just getting it right away because the Vicar Street show you told everybody you had free DVDs. And the reaction from the crowd was to tell you to fuck off, which you thought was hilarious. Oh, and then, oh yeah, some of that, yeah. And then Tree Arena, we cheered 9-11 for some reason. I don't know why. So it's like, this is a- Yeah, that's right. right. You guys, you cheered 9-11. I was like, 9-11, and you guys like, hey! And like, I, 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 I love that sense of humor where it's, um, I mean, the reason why I love that is because I do that when I watch TV. Like well, my, my wife like just goes through the emotions of things. And when there's fat people trying to lose weight or somebody talks about getting picked on at, at, at school and stuff, I'm dying laughing. She, and she's like hitting me like, why are you laughing at this? I'm just like, cause it's, it's cause it is sad. It's sad, but I'm also on another level. There's something so fucking irritating about this that I, that like this TV show is making money off of this person's misery. Like my wife uh, wa watches those fucking murder shows, you know, like the shows where they're like, you know, it's like real life and then people come on and just watching the interviewers trying to get the person to, to cry about their dead wife or dead brother. It's just one of the most reprehensible jobs. And you just see them like trying to pull it out of them. And they just go like, yeah, so, so you must miss them a lot, huh? <laughs> like... <laughs> How many showers do you take after that fucking interview? It's so messed up. It's a, I watched that uh, trial by Netflix, if, or sorry, trial by media on Netflix. Have you watched it? It's so messed up. It's like, I think it's George Clooney and Grant Hedloff produce it, but there's all these different stories about how like the media can twist things and, and turn things. And it's, it's pretty scary, especially, I think it was when they started filming trials, when they started broadcasting. Yeah. Probably like Core TV, that well, kind of thing. The problem is now is, uh, there's so many places to watch content that everybody in their own way has to be a bit of an ambulance chaser just to get people to stop. I mean, the fact that, you know, here we basically, we got like two 24 hour news networks, Fox and CNN, there's a bunch of them, but they're sort of the two big dogs and you're watching the news and there's no question who the person voted for, for president you know who they are. I mean, we had it's like people like CNN were like crying when Trump won. And I was just sitting there going like, can you be a fucking professional? Jesus Christ, pull yourself together, you know? So um, I, I, do, I do like, there's something wrong about that where you're supposed to, you're supposed to be bi unbiased, I would think, but that's, the, that's also the reason why I don't watch either one of those at all. Because uh, they're just, I don't know, they just, all they do is just blame each other. We have red ties and we know everything. Those guys with the blue ties, though, oh, we have blue ties. We're so much smarter than the people with the red ties. It's like, how long can you fucking sit there and watch that before it just gets boring? It's just like, at, at any point, does anybody... Like, would anybody ever on Fox News be like, all right, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, but did the president just suggest we, we shoot household cleaner into our bodies? Is there any way that maybe Mike Pence could do the speeches from here on out, you know? I mean, I, I, I try to stay out of that politics stuff, but like Trump is just like, he's just prolific as far as like just giving comedians material. So what's going to happen if he loses in November? All the hacks are going to be like done. The guys that would have just relied on Trump so much. Or Biden will come uh, a fair amount as well, I suppose. Yeah, man. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, it, I, I, have, I still think he's the favorite, if you can believe it. Like people will just, people are so like politics. I don't know what it's like where you live, but like politics where I live, it's like rooting for a sport. Like they, they have like a sports fans mentality. Like your team is never guilty of anything. Your team never cheats, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you'll say it amongst yourselves, but when the other people go, go, hey, that, that, was, that was fucked up, but that was a dirty play. Nah, fuck you, blah, 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 blah. So it's just a, a uh, I don't know. There's a lot of people that, I don't know, have given into that, which is, 
kind of, un it's unsettling. That's why I don't like talking about it. It's, it's fucking unsettling. Yeah, it's also the, the and I won't, I won't keep you for much longer, but the, the coverage is insane. I spoke to Pete Dominic about this, where he's somebody who does a lot of these panels and stuff. And I thought, why is the coverage of a primary debate like, you know, the halftime show at the Super Bowl, where they're like, you know, there might as well be heat maps. and It's, it's a yeah. supposed to be a debate. It's, it's nuts. Yeah, and then I also think that that gets politicians in their head, and then they, they, they have a zillion people telling them stuff and makes them perform. I mean, everything's changed. You know, speaking of the Super, time, Super Bowl halftime show, you know, when I was a kid, it was just a college band came out. You know? <laughs> they played the game during the day. I think the year that I watched it was the first year that they played it at night, I think. And now you look at it and it's just like, you know, they're trying to appeal to everybody and I don't know. This is, that's the one. I don't want to be this old guy that says everything's bad. All right? <laughs> I did get some positive uh, stuff for uh, young podcasters out there. Do not give up ownership of your show. Don't ever, and uh, don't sign away uh, power of attorney. Don't ever let somebody else be you on paper. Well, Bill, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Um, you're the first guest for this season, and I can't think okay. of I can't think of a, a better guest to launch with. Um, right. Like I said, I've seen well, you. I hope I get to come back there soon because uh, I, I've had so much. Some of the, my favorite shows I've ever done have been there, and um, you know, I one only one time I think I really toured the whole place. Where I went up to Belfast, out to Galway. You know, I only did Kill Kenny once, so. I would love to, uh, shit, I'd love to go outside at this point, but I would love to get back there at some point. And uh, my wife still tells a story <laughs> when we went over there. She loves the people over there. And she, uh, we, I don't know where the hell we were. We were someplace in Dublin. No, we didn't go to Temple Bar, okay? Smart, I realized smart. that's your yeah. Times Square. We didn't go there. So we, we asked, we were lost. So this guy was on a bicycle, stopped at a red light. <laughs> my wife goes, he goes, excuse me, do you know how to get to such and such? And he goes, he goes, I do. <laughs> he didn't say anything else. He goes, well, are you going to tell me? And he goes, I might. And well, however he did it, I'm butchering it. But my wife, uh, that was it. That was it. She just fell in love with that place and just thought, like, uh, thinks the world of it. So hopefully, I'm having a little boy here. In Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, so I'm hoping at some point, you know, now I feel like I'm going to have a family. You have one kid, it's like you're married, you have this special thing. You have two kids, then all of a sudden, you got these little kids conspiring against you. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, Bill, and congrats on the show and on the movie. I'd love, I'd love to see a Judd Apatow movie with you and Marissa Tomei's characters, sort of like what Judd did with, uh, this, with uh, this is 40 with Paul Rudd and Leslie Mann, because... Oh, it's fun. No, I mean... It's, it's, it stars Pete Dominic, so we frame this correctly. And Marissa Tomei might be the best actor I ever worked with. She was unbelievable. And now that I've seen a cut of the film, there was so much stuff she was doing that I, I didn't even notice. You know, when you see it on the, on the bigger screen, all of a sudden, all little things become big things. Uh, I noticed that was the stuff Steve Buscemi was doing, Dom Lombardozzi from The Wire and uh, Boardwalk Empire. There's a lot of heavy hitters in there, so they're holding me up pretty good. I don't know. You're pretty good in it too. And it's very funny. And F is for family. I binged a bunch of episodes over the past few days and it's as good as it ever was, Bill. Love it. Oh, Thanks great. so much for the great. time, Bill. Great. Oh, uh, Jonathan Banks from uh, Better Call Saul and, uh, and uh, Breaking Bad is placed by uh, Frank Murphy's dad this year. So we had a great time. So look out for that. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Bill. Thanks for the time.